Avoir. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Fit Pet Boston Talks. As always, I am Leah Lodato and I am the host of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. We do this podcast, my spouse Laurie and I, to uh, inform our clients and to provide a space for other dog trainers to get together and talk, get to know each other. I am happy to continue this project and I'm proud of the work that we do here. For the remainder of 2023, I'm planning to do an episode every Friday, and today I'm going to do a short episode and talk a little bit about the breakfast effect. So last week I talked about nutrition. I didn't give any specific advice regarding the type of dog food to feed your dog other than to give you some tools to help you think critically when it comes time to make that choice. There is a lot of information out there, and my best advice for you if you're interested is to do research. And by research, I mean listen to pet nutritionists, read articles, read scientific studies, um, things like podcasts like the one you're listening to now or blog posts or Instagram posts or Instagram influencers or marketers are going to have different reasons for giving you the information that they are giving you. So it's tough out there, not going to lie. Next week, we're going to talk about carbohydrate metabolism. Actually, I just may have told you a fib. Next week, I think I'm going to do an episode with Laurie. So there may be a week in between this episode and the episode where I talk about carbohydrate metabolism. I just want to let it be known that I am not a nutritionist. I'm a dog trainer and dog handler. I spend most of my time walking dogs, but our clients often ask us about nutrition. And my job as a ethical trainer is to help them think critically when it comes time to make these decisions. My job is to not endorse a specific way of feeding or a specific brand of dog food because I believe that Dogs are individuals and some are going to do really well on a certain type of food, whereas others would not do well on the same exact food. I I do believe in universal truths, right? And I would suggest that if you're interested in learning more about ratings and reviews and quality of dog food, you can check out the Dog Food Advisor. It is... Uh, an independent review and they review the quality of the ingredients of the food, the digestibility, and they will rate different dog foods on a scale of one to five. They'll also give you free dog food recall alerts if you wanted to sign up for those alerts. I think I can speak for everybody when I say we should not be feeding dog food that gets recalled. Uh, In fact, I would go so far as to say you should probably not buy food from a dog food company that gets routinely recalled just to be on the safe side. So a couple of years ago, I read this study that talked about this, uh, I guess you call it phenomena of the breakfast effect for dogs. And it's not super complicated, but it kind of got my mind moving and led me to make some decisions about the way that I choose to train my dog. So the basic idea of the study was that, well, I'll just read the whole abstract here. I'm sorry for the technicality of this episode and probably the next episode, but whatever. You're here along for the ride. Have a little mental snack. Sit back, relax, and uh, take it all in. Okay, here we go. So the abstract of the study for the breakfast effect. We investigated whether the consumption of a morning meal by dogs would affect search accuracy on a working memory task following the exertion of self-control. Dogs were tested either 30 or 90 minutes after consuming half of their daily resting energy requirements. And during testing, dogs were initially required to sit still for 10 minutes before searching for hidden food and visible displacement task. We found that 30 minutes following the consumption of breakfast and 10 minutes after the behavioral inhibition task, dogs search more accurately than they did in a fasted state. A reason for this phenomena is that there is more glucose circulating around in the dog's bloodstream and that glucose gets up to their brain and increases the function uh, of those problem solving skills that are needed to execute those tasks, right? kind of like a simple, a simplified explanation from somebody who's not an expert. So take that with a grain of salt. But our brains and central nervous systems, like a dog's brain and central nervous system, is going to utilize glucose that's floating around in our bloodstream in order to function. 
So that being said, how do I employ this information when it comes time for me to train my dogs? And do I do training sessions with my dogs when they're in a completely fasted state? And the answer to that question is it depends on like what I'm doing and how I'm training. So uh, I'm going to use Raven as an example. So my little Reuben is uh, pretty much retired from all obedience activities. I will play disc dog sports with him and I can go through like our feeding schedule when I play with him. And I will go through the feeding schedule that I use for the two of them before we we play just so that you have an idea of how I make decisions. So um, I'm going to take Raven. So Raven is um, a bred Labrador retriever and we do um, obedience training. We do a little bit of field work. And I, I think that there's a difference between the teaching part of like obedience training and then the problem solving skills that she has to utilize if we are doing field work. And I would say that if we are doing either of those things at this stage in her training, I'm not doing a lot of food luring. And the reason I wanted to bring up food luring is I think that if you are trying to lure behaviors, I think that you can, I can do that when my dog is completely fasted with success. So if I'm just trying to get my dog to follow my hand with the food, and put them in a sit position or a down position or teach them a stand. Um, And that's the stage in the learning process that we're in. So showing them how to be successful. They're not necessarily problem solving very much to be successful. I think that training in a fasted state works great. So uh, for example, I could take Raven right out of her crate in the morning without having breakfast. And let's say we were working on a stand for exam. I could lure her with food into that position and she could do that in a fasted state like just fine. Lately, I've been moving beyond the luring phase to the more proofing phase. So she may already know the behavior and she might have to do a little bit more problem solving because maybe I need to add a little bit more um, pressure if she's not complying completely to a behavior that she knows, or maybe I'm adding distractions to a behavior that she knows, or maybe I am more in like the shaping phase of a behavior that she knows but is offering a lot, and so I'm not doing so much luring with food. In that situation, I will feed her breakfast before we do our training session. So what does that breakfast look like? Well, she wakes up between like 6 and 6.30, I'm up. I let her out and I try to get a small ration of food in, just in her bowl um, right after she comes in from her first out. And that usually is about like a half a cup of kibble. Then I'll go through my morning routine, whatever I'm doing, And I usually leave for work between 9 and 9.30. And what I'll do is I'll do a 20-minute to a half an hour training session with her around 8 o'clock. So after she's been crated for a little while, after she has just a little bit of food, she'll come out lately. We've been doing a lot of healing. (laughs) Healing is so hard, you guys. Anybody that could heal their dog and it looks good, I'm just like, oh my word, that is such an amazing feat because, I mean, healing is just such a tough, a tough, tough thing to do, be able to do consistently. So we've been working a lot on healing. Again, it's more in the proofing stage, and I haven't really been using food a lot for a reward because she really likes to play, so I'm able to use that toy motivation to keep her engaged. And... I haven't really compared her focus um, from not feeding breakfast to feeding breakfast. I just think that it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me to have a little bit of food in her before we train 
because she is a very, very food-driven dog. And if you've worked with a food-driven dog or a really toy-driven dog even, sometimes that drive and motivation can almost be overwhelming to the dog's capacity to um, think, right? So like if they're super hungry and all they're thinking about is that food reward, sometimes the quality of the behavior can get a little crazy, Right. And if we're talking like low level training, like you're just trying to get your dog to sit or lay down or go to place or whatever, like who cares? But when you're trying to heal your dog, like do something very specific, I do think that their state of mind really matters. So I choose to feed her a little bit about an hour, hour and a half before we're doing our training session. When we do our training sessions for any type of gun dog stuff, which is something that I do a little bit less of now because I have some hard goals for the next couple of months. But like if I take her out and we're doing retrieves or doing like blind retrieves or I'm trying to work on her hold for the fetch process, I certainly want her to be in the best mental state that she possibly can be for problem solving because she is going to have to work through pressure and learn how to turn pressure on and off and use her reasoning capabilities to execute some pretty high level behaviors. And I want her mental capacity to be as good as it can be whilst keeping her safe. So why did I just say why keeping her safe? Well, Generally speaking, I want to wait about two hours after feeding my dog a full meal before I do anything athletic with them because there's always a risk of bloat in dogs. So I don't want to feed Raven two cups of food for breakfast because she eats about four cups of food a day. I don't want to feed her all of that food and then take her out to the field and have her running around, right? So I'm going to ration the food a little differently. I'm going to give her the half a cup of food before we do anything and let her sit on it for an hour, hour and a half and then go out and do our work. With the idea being that she has a little bit more of that juicy glucose in her system working up towards her brain, giving her a little bit of an edge when it comes to that higher level obedience training where she has to work through problems. After we do our training session created and I will wait for her to stop panting and then feed her the remainder of her breakfast if we didn't use it for training. I do oftentimes use food for training, of course. So if I don't use her breakfast for training, she'll get the rest of it in a bowl. And we'll probably do a training session in the afternoon after I come home from work. And then, um, you know, dinner time. And again, sometimes I use food for training. Sometimes I don't. I like to use toys as much as possible as I can f- for training. And of course, if we're, you know, in the field doing some sort of bird work, um, you know, I'm not really using that much food for training. So that's kind of how I employ the breakfast effect. Um, Not employ, but how I have internalized the concepts in the study about feeding dogs before they do work. And I've had success with it. Again, I haven't really tried to not do it. I've just been doing that for a while now. The other thing that is useful about feeding your dog breakfast is that sometimes dogs, when they wake up, will have a little bit of stomach upset and you might see like bile. They puke a little bit and it's like just like yellow bile. And from my personal experience, that oftentimes does happen with dogs like that have a faster metabolism or are very active. So I like having a little bit of food on the dog's stomach before we get going just to prevent that from happening. Uh, Both of my dogs, will, Raven and Ruben, will have that if they wake up and they don't eat within a few hours of waking. So let's talk about a day where I'll do like a heavier activity. So like if I'm bringing both of my dogs to toss and fetch, toss and fetch starts at 9 a.m. this past league season. And, um, you know, it's a longer morning. So, and I am demanding quite a bit from my dogs when it comes to their stamina and when it comes to their focus. So my routine on toss and fetch days is I wake up at about 530. I let the dogs out. And when they come back in, I'll feed Raven about two thirds of her breakfast and I'll feed Ruben his full breakfast by 6 a.m. 
and then let them go out again before we leave at around 8 a.m. And then we're on the field at 9 and they may do their runs anywhere between 9 and 1030. So that gives plenty of time for the digestion to kick in and for them to um, be kind of out of that window for the risk of bloat. And they still have all of those juicy nutrients and they still and they're able to have the, um, you know, the all the good, good goodies for their brain. And it for the most part, like I haven't seen any negative effects of making those decisions. So I figured I'd share them with you guys, not to say that you should do that for your dog. I'm just telling you what has worked out for me. There is a, um, there's an advantage to working with a hungry puppy in the morning, right? We get the hungry puppy, they're motivated. It's easy to begin teaching them behaviors. If you are able to teach them those behaviors quickly, put them on a variable reward schedule, start to use different things for training like toys. If you are doing different types of training, it might not require as much food training. Um, You know, feel free to manipulate your food to your advantage, which is exactly what I'm doing (laughs) when I'm training my dogs. I think I can speak for Laurie like she doesn't bring Buddha to competition when he is starving because there's a you know there's an advantage to working with a hungry and motivated dog but that can flip over if your dog is so in a in a state of deprivation that they're not really able to think through the activity at hand so that's a little bit of two sides to a coin these issues have a little bit of nuance to them and you have to figure out what's going to work best for you and your dog So again, that's just a little episode about the breakfast effect, about how I have utilized that, the mentality that I have for training. It works out for me. If you do it different or you got any ideas from this episode, feel free to reach out anytime and we will see you next weekend.